like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. Christ the Lord became obedient unto death. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought and word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We pray you of your mercy, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, look graciously, we pray, on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Would you please be seated for the proclamation of the word. The first lesson is taken from Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals, so he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had been not been told him they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hid their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he was born of our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offering and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord.
Second lesson. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who is promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Jesus answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the King of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him and they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross, it was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, 
and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the King of the Jews, and with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who had stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please be seated? Did it have to end this way? That is the central question Christians have been asking themselves in theology, in art, in ethics, in every endeavor to which the Christian mind has placed its energy. It's asked the question, did it have to end this way? Was it inevitable? For a long time, and even up to today, there are people who believe that somehow um, God's anger could only be placated by an offering of blood, consistent with the Old Testament view of the temple, the sort of engine of Israel, the engine of prayer, and that Christ's death was inevitable from God's point of view. Not everyone buys that, by the way. That ends up being quite difficult for some people to comprehend how a loving God can demand the death of his son in order to pay back sin. That's not the only way to look at it. But for a very long time, codified by our very own Archbishop of Canterbury, St. Anselm, that was one of the ways people thought about it. Struggling with the inevitability of the cross is the central tenet of Good Friday. It's like trying to explain to a small child why, if Jesus is suffering and dying on the cross, we call today good. And trying to explain to a small child the concept of paradox you know, two truths that put side by side who look to be completely contradictory and yet are the same isn't really terribly helpful. But the inevitability of the cross is borne out in another way. 
Many of you are old enough to remember great parades in October, um, usually televised, of all of the Russian Politburo standing on top of Lenin's tomb. Do you remember these pictures? As the tanks and the, the missile vehicles and the armies marched by. And there on the top of Lenin's tomb would be a whole line of sort of fedoras and guys all bundled up against the Russian winter. And they would either stand there and kind of do this as they all went by or salute or do something like, do you remember that? Do you have that image? You don't? Some of you are shaking your heads. How quickly we forget. This is, this is something that is drilled into me. Because at the same time, Good Friday is a struggle between power you can see, the Roman centurion, the Roman government, the wheels of justice, perverted or otherwise, power you can see, sense, and feel. And on the other side, power you can't see, the dialogue between Christ and his Father, calling out to him in the midst of his suffering. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All that the Politburo watched go by was what they had built for themselves in this world. All that the oppression and control and dehumanization of a system could do to a human people to gather all of their resources around power, might. And yet, where is it now? Where is that power, principality, or kingdom? What Good Friday is about is reminding us that the power that we cannot see is often more important than the power we can see. All of the violence and the horror of Good Friday, which was the human contribution to the story of redemption, is the power you can see. I'm going to say that again, just so you get it really clear. All of the violence, the blood, the horror, the death, the alienation, all of that was the human contribution to the story of redemption. That was not God's addition. You see, from the moment we are born, one thing is absolutely sure. I know Ben Franklin said there were two, death and taxes, but I'm here to tell you theologically, being born means one thing. You will die. So that's why those of you who want the rosy Christmas scene of the baby gurgling in the manger always end up with that verse, three or four verses into the Christmas carol that often gets skipped, which foreshadows what's to come. The moment Christ was born, the moment God was in our flesh, one thing was inevitable. Death. How Christ got there was our contribution. How he got there was our contribution. And God knew because he had made this creature, this willful, glorious, sinning, troubled, wonderful, artful, imaginative, violent creature. God knew that if Christ were to walk the earth, that we would be held up 
and arrested by his grace, by his love, and by his teaching. And in holding a mirror to all of humanity, which is what Jesus did, humanity decided they'd rather smash the mirror than change. That whole passage we hear from Isaiah about he had no visage about him that made anyone look at him, there's nothing special about him, and yet here he was. Jesus was as ordinary as they come. It doesn't matter how beautiful Easter will be, you have got to face the truth of the violence and the horror of Good Friday. There are a lot of people, a lot of people who just kind of skip Good Friday. They do Palm Sunday because that's a good parade. That's a nice party, that one, right? Hosanna. <laughs> and they blow right past the agony in the garden and the betrayal on Thursday night and the drama of the trial and the denial of Peter and, and the, the worries and then the scourging and the mocking. Am I laying it on too thick? Because I'm not laying it on thick enough. We want to blow past all that and we want to get to the brass and the lilies and the trumpets and the alleluias. But you have got to sit tight and abide with the struggle in the garden and the agony on the cross. Because the agony on the cross was our contribution, the human contribution to the process of redemption. The power that you could see on Good Friday was a power of an oppressive state pushing down on those who would give them trouble. It was the power of people who wanted the status quo to go untouched. This is what happens to troublemakers. Don't upset the apple cart. Don't give us trouble. Don't make us worry. Don't interrupt our sleep. Don't get in the way. That's the power you can see. The power you can't see is God taking all of this violence, and I'm not talking just the violence of the cross, but if it doesn't overwhelm you for a second, think about all, all of the sin through all of time since then. All of the violence and the death and the famine and the war all of the suffering and the brokenness, all of it, and it has been laid on this one man. And he looks at the world and says, Father, forgive them. If ever there were grace incarnate, it's that moment. And we will find our way. We will find our way to the lilies and the brass. We will find our way to the place of resurrection. We will recognize that God will not permit our violence to go unanswered except by his grace. God will not permit our violence to go unanswered except by his grace. And it is that profound, divine renunciation, a renunciation of all the wrath and anger that we would otherwise assign to God and aptly heap on ourselves and keep the violence going and keep the cycle going and keep the tears going. It is that divine renunciation that sets us free. From this moment on, you can never claim that there's an easy out. From this moment on, there is no scapegoat because there is one perfect sacrifice. And anyone who tries to tell you that the power you can see is more important than the power you can't see is a liar. And that 
is what makes this Friday good. All that God has done and all that God will do, all that we are, all that we have, all that will we become, has been wrapped up in this single moment we commemorate today. And no matter how low you feel, no matter how deep your despair, no matter how awful your situation, it too has been crucified. And all of the violence, all of the degradation, all of the pain that we have leveled at one another has also been forgiven and crucified on that cross. And that makes today good. So don't rush. Don't rush to get to the lilies and the brass. Don't rush to put on the best. Don't, don't even rush for the lamb supper or the ham dinner or whatever it is you're going to have. Don't rush. Right now, right now, abide with him in this moment as he takes on all of our brokenness so that we may be set free. At this moment, abide with him as he takes on all our infirmities, all our diseases, all our lies, all our despair, all our brokenness, and crucifies them on the cross. Abide with him and wait with him because in the end, today is the beginning of the process of emptying your grave. I'm going to say that again. Today is the beginning of the process of emptying your grave. Because inasmuch as his will be empty on Sunday morning, ours will be empty one day, praise Jesus Christ, because of today. And that makes today good. Amen.
Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of eternal life. Let us pray for the one holy Catholic and apostolic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for William our Bishop and all the people of this diocese, and for all Christians in this community for those about to be baptized, that the Lord will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by your spirit, the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified. Receive our supplications and prayers, which we offer before you for all members of your Holy Church, that in our vocation and ministry we may truly and devoutly serve you. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them, for Charles, our King, and all the royal family, for Justin, the Prime Minister, and for the government of this country, for Mark, our Member of Parliament, for Doug, the Premier of this province, and the members of the Legislature, for Ted, our Member of the Provincial Parliament, for Brian, the Mayor of this municipality, and those who serve with him on the City Council, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that justice and peace may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, and all who suffer persecution or prejudice, for the sick, the wounded and the handicapped, for those in loneliness, fear and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, hear the cry of those in misery and need. In their afflictions, show them your mercy and give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for all who have not heard the words of salvation, for all who have lost their faith, for all whose sin has made them indifferent to Christ, for all who actively oppose Christ by word or deed, for all who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, 
for all who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have departed this life and have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, Look favorably on your whole church that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Behold the wood of the cross, whereon was hung the Savior of the world. Come on, O my people, what have I done to thee or wherein have I wearied thee? Answer me, because I brought thee out of the land of Egypt, thou hast prepared a cross for thy Saviour. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Because I led thee through the desert forty years, and fed thee with manna, and brought thee into a land exceeding good, Thou hast prepared a cross for thy Saviour. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. What could I do more for thee that I have not done? I planted thee my choicest vine, and thou hast become exceeding bitter unto me. For when I was thirsty, thou gavest me to drink vinegar mingled with gall, and has pierced with a spear the side of thy Saviour. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. We venerate thy cross, O Lord. And praise and glorify thy holy resurrection, for by virtue of the cross, joy is coming to the whole world.
as our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you have restored us to life by that triumphant death and resurrection of Christ. Continue this healing work within us. May we who partake of this mystery never cease to give you dedicated service. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Send down your abundant blessing, Lord, upon your people who have devoutly recalled the death of your Son in the sure and certain hope of resurrection. Grant them pardon. Bring them comfort. May their faith grow stronger and their eternal salvation be assured. We ask this through Christ the Lord. Amen. Amen.